you're really committed to being world class, if you really believe you have a given purpose, and those three goals that you put out there for six months are going to change your life, change other people's lives, and help you become world class, why wouldn't you spend some time every single day accomplishing it? So Welcome class, to Life of a System. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, Question your host, and we'll be you. taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole. I hope you enjoy this time together because I'll tell you it's some of my favorite time where we just get to meet virtually. I wish we could meet in person and we will very soon. We're looking at uh, putting together some events and doing some other fun activity uh, where we can interact in person, uh, right? But for now, we'll go the virtual route and I hope you're enjoying each of these episodes. As always, if there's anything we can do to help you, you can either post below uh, topics or things you would like me to cover in upcoming Life of a CISO podcast, or you can reach out to me directly, uh, ecole, E-C-O-L-E, at secure-anchor.com. Uh, and that goes to my team. So uh, myself or someone from my team will get back to you and we can provide you great information. If you want more formal training, more formal coaching, more formal one-on-one, -on -one, you basically want to accelerate and go to the next level. You can either, once again, email me or go to secure-anchor.com cyber crisis or secure-anchor.com so we got a lot of links there a lot of great content I encourage you to reach out join our community join our mailing list and see how we can help you go to the next level because remember i have one goal and one goal only you know what that is come on if you've been here for a while you know what that is come on say it say it's it. it's to be world class right we're not about average if you just want to be average if you just want to get a job with the CISO title yeah, you, you could listen to my content and go through my training and you will get a job as a CISO, but you'll probably get frustrated because I'm going to push you way beyond average. I'm going to push you way out of that comfort zone and I'm going to push you to being world class. Now, first thing I want to start off with is a pattern that I've noticed. World class people, world class CISOs, World-class professionals know exactly what they want. Average people do not. And it's interesting. If I ask you right now, what do you want in your career? What do you want in your life? What do you want in your personal side? Right, and I go in and start asking you these types of questions. The interesting part is most people without even realizing it, do you know how they'll answer it? They'll tell me what they don't want. Right? And I've done this experiment over and over and over again. I'm, I'm like, t -t tell me what you want for your career. And you're like, well, I don't want to work for a company that blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to work for a boss that doesn't appreciate what I do. And I don't want to report to the CISO. And I'm like, great. You just told me what you don't want. Right? You don't want to report to the CISO. Right? You don't want to work for a company that you're not invited out to the board meetings and you're not respected. But what do you want? Right? Let's flip the equation. Let's not focus on what you don't want. Let's focus on what you do want. I want to be a CISO for a Fortune 50 company in six months. Awesome. That I can help you with. Right? That we can work with. If you tell me what you want and you get crystal clear on it, I can actually help you. Well, let you know on a secret. I'm not really doing anything. Because if you get crystal clear on what you want and it becomes a burning desire where it becomes an obsession and that's all you think about and all you focus on, guess what? You'll do it, not me, right? I'll, I'll just show you what you need to do and I'll hold you accountable and I'll make sure that you're absolutely doing it. 
but you're the one that really did the work. You get all the credit for becoming world class. So just want you to spend a little time right now thinking about what you want and write down three specific things that you would want for the next six months. Now, very important, make sure there's no knots or negatives. Make sure you're not telling me what you don't want, right? Make sure you're not doing that. Make sure you're very, very clear on what you specifically want. You got those three things. Okay. Now, what are three specific things that you need to do in the next 30 days in order to be able to accomplish those three things in the next six months? And then, what are three very specific things that you can do today to be able to make sure that you accomplish the things that you need in 30 days to accomplish what you want in six months? So notice what we're doing here. We're not just setting out a goal in the future, but we're then backwards planning it. And yes, there's many ways to do this. You could do five years, three years, one year quarterly. I find with my clients, I've tried a lot of things. I find the 631 works the best because it's just three things. So let's come up with some broad things that you can do in six months. Then what are specific sub items that you need to do in the next 30 days? So essentially what we're really doing with our clients is we're taking those six months, those three things. And for each of them, we're saying, what are the six pieces that need to occur? Now, it might be three pieces that each take two months, right? It's not an exact science, but I think you're getting the point here. And then we're taking each of those 30 and breaking them down into 30 pieces. So, so, So now we're getting very, very specific. So each day, we're doing one thing for each of our three goals, which makes it three things a day. Right, one for each of those three. So now we're getting a system that's not overly complicated. The problem I find with some of these other systems where you sit there and say, okay, come up with five year, then one year, then quarterly, then month. It's it just, it's way too hard and way too much for people to digest. So just try my simple system. In six months, what are three specific things that you want to accomplish that you need to accomplish, that you must accomplish. Then break them down into sub pieces, four to six pieces every 30 days. And then take those 30 days and break them out to specific daily action. Now, whether you meet the goals or you don't, and the trick is you'll actually get them done a lot quicker. I've never had anybody do this system, even people that had very, very aggressive, ridiculous goals not get them done a lot sooner. Because let's face it, if you're doing something every day, every single day, you're doing something to accomplish a goal, it's doing a couple things. One, you're making forward progress. And two, it's always on your mind. I forget who sings it. You are always on my mind. Right, you are always on my mind. Right, I, I think Willie Nelson. Right, yeah, Willie Nelson. There. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, that, and that's why I don't sing. Right, I love singing. Uh, that's why I, I I jam in my car by myself. The problem is with a convertible, you got to be careful when you're at a light because people can hear you sing and they sometimes look at you. But who cares? We're having fun here, right? So that's what it's all about. So it should always be on your mind. You should always be thinking about it. Now, here's the other little trick here. The other little trick. When I say every day you must do one item for each of those goals, it could be something that takes five minutes. It could be something that takes an hour or three hours. It depends on your day. So you're looking at what you have currently going on and you're creating an item that will make forward progress, but that you can fit within that day. You're not doing something ridiculous. Uh, You want to make sure it can actually be done. Another very important thing, and this is critical. 
every day. That means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That means Saturday. That means Sunday. That means birthdays. That means holidays. Every day. And here's why. If you train yourself that this is a non-negotiable, this must be done every day. Every day, you're going to check a box. Every day, you're going to do something, no matter how small or how big it is. But every single day, the motivation and excitement will build. But if you're only doing something five out of seven days, it's really hard to build a habit. Because then here's what's going to happen. On Wednesday, you're going to get busy. And you're going to be like, you know something? I, I just don't have time today. And you know what your mind's going to say? Well, it's okay. Because you didn't do it on Saturday or Sunday. So it's, it's okay to take another day off. Well, what's one more day? And then what happens is we get to the end of 30, 60, 90 days, and you've done two or three things instead of 30, 60, or 90 things. So this is something I just have to ask. How committed are you? How important is this to your life? Are you committed to being world-class? Are you committed to being average? I try to be mean here. I'm just trying to be honest here because if you're really committed to being world-class, if you really believe you have a given purpose and those three goals that you put out there for six months are going to change your life, change other people's lives, and help you become world-class, why wouldn't you spend some time every single day accomplishing it? So becoming world-class is not hard. The recipe is easy. The question I have for you is, are you willing to follow it? Are you willing to go in and do it? And then here's the final piece. If you just do what I said, you have a great probability. If you want to guarantee success, guarantee that those three things will absolutely happen. In addition to doing three things every day, one item against each of those three goals, in addition, this is not, this doesn't count as one of those three things, right? In addition, every morning when you wake up in your journal, you write down those three goals or three things you want in the morning. And then you do that at noon, you do that at five, and you do that before you go to bed. So now four times a day, and this takes 30 seconds, or maybe two minutes, depending on how big your goals or wants are. But you go in and write it down four times a day. What you're once again doing is, you are always on my mind, right? You are making it front and center. That is what you become obsessed with. That is what you become thinking about. That is what your subconscious mind is constantly thinking about when you're focusing on other items or you're sleeping or doing other things. So that, that's that final little guarantee piece. Four times a day, in addition to those three items, you write down those three goals. And this, I know it sounds crazy. This really needs to be paper and pencil. I, I, I'm not sure why I've done it both ways. I've typed it on my iPad, right? I even written it on my iPad with a uh, I, I pen or whatever that thing is on there. But there's something about pen and paper. So go old school here. Get, get a journal right, and just carry it around. And you're just, depending on how long those goals are, you might be able to get all four on one piece of paper. You might do two on one and two on the other. So you get a front and back every day. Whatever works for you, come up with a system. But old school pen and paper. And if you start getting very focused and obsessed with the goals, nothing, nothing will be able to stop you. So now let's switch to some specific CISO questions I'm getting. And that one that's coming up more and more is Eric. How do you brief a board of directors, right? One of the big roles of a CISO is to be a translator. You need to be a translator between tech and business. So you need to be able to meet with the security team, 
understand what they're saying, translate into business language, and be able to speak business in front of the executives. And if you're doing that correctly, a key part of your job as a CISO is to spend time with the executives, with the COO, the CEO, the CFO, and to brief the board of directors on cybersecurity. Very important job. And this also can not only turn in to some side work, but this can also turn into a career because prior to the SEC making this ruling, the SEC recently, I believe it's, it's going to be, uh, they're finalizing it now, but it'll probably be official, I think it's nine or 12 months, that any publicly traded company must have a CISO on their board of directors. They must have a chief information security officer sitting on their board to be able to address, influence, and guide cybersecurity questions. So let me ask you that. If that's something that's going to be required and you can do that very, very well, there's not a lot of people that can, because remember, not all, not all, there's some amazing world-class sisters out there that get this. Unfortunately, a lot of the CISOs out there today are much stronger on the technical side. They're really security engineers that want to be CISOs, but they're not world-class translators. Their technical ability is much, much stronger than their business and strategy ability. And that's a weakness. World-class translators can speak both languages fluently. They might have one that they started with. They might even claim they have one that's their favorite. But world-class translators can speak both languages fluently and equally as good. And what makes somebody a world-class translator is they can adapt on the fly. If they're talking to somebody who speaks German, boom. They don't have to think about it. They're automatically speaking German. And if they come up with somebody that's speaking French, boom. Their mind can automatically adapt. And I've seen this where at events or get-togethers, you have this world-class translator who's actually almost simultaneously talking to three different people, carrying on three different conversations in three different languages. And their brain can just switch back and forth. That's where you need to be as a CISO. That's where you need to be in terms of speaking business and speaking technical. When you're in front of executives, business and strategy. When you're in front of the engineers, technical and false positives. Right? And must be able to make that switch. So this is a skill set that you can build. This is a skill set that I urge you, if you want to be world-class CISO, you must get really, really good at. And the way you get really good at things is by doing them over and over and over again. So you need to get out of that comfort zone and start presenting to executives, start presenting to boards. Now, here's the interesting part. It will become a self-fulfilling prophecy because the better you get at it, the more requests you will have. So you want to just keep doing this over and over again. So how do we do this? First and foremost, you always start off the presentation understanding that cybersecurity is a business problem. So you want to make that very clear up front. I personally believe that if cybersecurity is done correctly, it can be a business enabler. Now that sounds like a phrase, but let me explain what that means. I believe proper cybersecurity done at a strategic level across the enterprise can actually increase revenue, increase profit, increase stability, and increase user experience. Would you like to find out more? Right? Now you have their attention. Now they know you're speaking their language. Then 
I go in and talk about the reality of the threats. Now we have to be careful because many executives basically get their information on cybersecurity from the news. If you follow the news, regardless of what stations you like or don't like, but if you follow the news, it comes down very simple. You believe that major cyber attacks happen every quarter, maybe one or two times a quarter, and that when they do happen, there's absolutely nothing the organization can do. Because that's what the media says. Basically, the, if you remember solar winds and uh, all these other attacks, it's, these were the most advanced attacks we've ever seen. It would have taken thousands of programmers, thousands. Of, I mean, they just lay this on. And if you don't have anyone else in your corner translating for you, you would believe that to be true. So the other thing that I do is I always start off and say, let's demystify. I have good news and bad news. Let's start with the bad news. Cyber attacks do not happen quarterly, and they do not only happen against big publicly traded companies. Cyber attacks happen on a daily, hourly basis, and they occur against every single company. Let me explain why. And then you go in and explain, while technically, the smaller the company, the less security they have, the less money they can spend, the less resources, and therefore, technically, the easier it is to break in. So these attackers actually understand that and are now going after those companies. And this is where you tailor it to the board you're talking to. So if you're talking to a medium-sized company, you use medium-sized examples. If you're talking to a large, small, but the point is you tailor it to that environment, to the size of the business, and the type of business they work in. And you explain that it's not quarterly, it's not once in a while, you are going to be targeted and you are going to be hit. Now, the good news in all this is these attacks that we're seeing today are not that advanced. Now, yes, they are often done by advanced adversaries, but right now the means and methods they use to break in are not very advanced, which means if you put some time, energy, and effort, many of the attacks that we have seen out there today are preventable. These are preventable attacks. Would you like to know how? Right? So, so, so you see where I'm going. I'm, I'm engaging. I'm giving them new information. And I'm giving them new data. At this point in the conversation, I usually go in and give them some action they can take. And I could say the reason why companies are struggling today in cybersecurity is for one simple reason. When business decisions are made, only one question is being asked. And that question is a good question. That question is, what is the value or benefit to the business? So if we go in and say, okay, we look at Colonial Pipeline. They had to make a decision of whether to connect the critical infrastructure, the industrial control systems, to the internet. And they asked one question, what is the value and benefit? It will cut down costs, it will make it easier for updates, it will make it easier for maintenance, it will make it easier for people to work from home, especially during the pandemic, make it easier for customers to be able to get access to their information. It will speed up billing, it will speed up uh, production. And, and they went through this list. Wow, that's a really good list. That's a lot of really good items. And because they only asked one question, what did they do? They said, let's do that. Because this has a lot of really good benefit to the business. What you need to do as an executive is you need to ask a second question. The first question is good. What is the value to the business? But you now need to ask a second question. What is the risk or exposure by doing this? And then step back, look at the answers to the two questions, and now ask yourself, is the risk and exposure worth 
the value or benefit. If we go back to colonial, we went through all of the great stuff. Now, if we step back and we say, what is the risk and exposure? The risk and exposure is our entire pipeline could be taken down. Attackers could take complete control. They could hold it ransom. We could lose production for weeks and we might have to pay three to $5 million ransom to get it back up again, let alone 20 to $30 million to fix the long-term damage. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Executive, is that value or benefit worth that risk or exposure? And I think we could all very, very quickly say, no. I, I cannot believe for a second that executives at these companies know and understand what the true risk is and still making the decision. It just, it, it does not make any logical business sense. No effective world-class business people, and that's who they are, would make that decision. The issue is they're only asking one question. So I urge you, as you make any decision, whether it's at a high level or your team or your staff, start asking a second question. Start asking yourself, what is the risk and exposure? And then see, is the value or benefit worth the risk or exposure? Break out a roll. So hopefully you're starting to see sort of how, how you do these executive presentations. You start off by showing them what the problem is and that you understand the problem. You then translate to them what's really happening, what the threats really are. You scare them a little bit saying it's actually worse than it seems and your probability of compromise is much higher than you realize from the news. But then you give them hope that these are preventable and these can be done. And then you give them a strategic solution. Notice, I didn't talk anything about firewalls, IDSs, SIMs, prevention, detection, fall. That's not executive presentation. They don't care and they don't want to know that, right? They want to know high level what the reality is, what is happening, what are the facts, and what they can do about it. And that's sort of my basic core. Now, you can also add in some specific components if you've done assessments for the company or understand their business. But usually at that point, I do about 15, 20 minutes and then I open it up for Q&A. And it's always funny because whenever, and I do a lot of these board of presentations, so if I can help you or your company, let me know. But they always come in, if this is the first time, bringing me in or somebody like me, they're like, okay, Eric, th th these executives have very limited time. They only have 30 minutes. You must stick to the agenda. I'm like, absolutely. I'm like, 15 minutes presentation, 15 minute Q&A. Absolutely, great. I have never ever, ever had a presentation that hasn't gone for at least 45 to 60 minutes in which it's driven by them. I always get done in 10 to 15, but the Q&A always goes longer and longer and longer because this is a hot topic that's very, very important to the executives. So that just gives you a little flavor. Now, that works for me, but just so you realize that's Five years of adapting, adjusting, modifying. So the good news is you're starting off five years ahead of most people. I'm giving you the formula that works. Go back and listen. and I've sort of laid out the key pieces. However, you're brilliant and you're world class. So I urge you to take it to the next level. I urge you to modify and change it. Try mine for a little bit because it's a good starting point, but don't be afraid to adapt and adjust. So remember, as we finish up this episode of Life of a CISO being world-class, what do you want? What do you really want to do this six-month experiment where every single day you take action and start practicing your executive presentation skills? Even if it's for free, start presenting in front of as many boards as possible. Use the formula because the more you do it, the better you get. And the better you get, the closer you will be to truly revealing your world class status. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next week.